Richard asked me to talk about cosmology, um, and I originally gave, I, I talked uh, to uh, Liz Cornwall, who was organizing this, and told her what I was going to talk about, and, 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 and gave her several titles, and she thought they were too depressing, so she said, why don't you just make it, uh, we're all fucked. But, uh, uh, but I decided not to use that title. I, I'm going to talk about our modern picture of cosmology and how it's changed our view of the universe, the past, and the future. And in some sense, how that picture is clearly remarkable, and far more remarkable than the fairy tales that are made up um, in most religious um, situations. But what I want to talk to you about is how our picture has changed the universe so much that the really important stuff in the universe is not the stars and galaxies, but the stuff you can't see. The mysterious stuff that dominates nature. How do we know the universe is expanding? It's such an important thing, I want to spend a few minutes on that. If they're moving away from us, the light, which is a wave, gets stretched out. The longer wavelength part of light, or the red end of the spectrum, so it's called redshifted. And galaxies are more and more redshifted the further and further they are away from us. So that's how we know their velocity. This is something that, that, that I wrote a whole book about, and someone asked me yesterday why I wrote that book. Because it is the most poetic thing I know about the universe. But the amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? We now know the rate of expansion of the universe to 10%, not a factor of 10. And we therefore, in fact, we now know the age of the universe through other things extremely accurately to f almost four decimal places. 13.72 billion years is the age of the, of the universe. If you take empty space, and that means get rid of all the particles, all the radiation, absolutely everything. So there's nothing there. If that nothing weighs something, then it contributes a term like this. That sounds ridiculous. Why should nothing weigh something? Nothing is nothing. The answer is nothing isn't nothing anymore in physics. Because of the laws of quantum mechanics and special relativity, on extremely small scales, nothing is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. The point is, it, we can't measure virtual particles directly, but we can measure their effects indirectly. And in fact, they're responsible for the best predictions of physics. This is the space inside of a proton. And this is, not a, this is an animation, but it's an exact animation coming from physical calculations. This is what the space looks like. How do we know that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the things are, it turns out most of the mass of the proton comes not from the quarks within a proton, but from the empty space between the quarks. These fields popping in and out of existence produce about 90% of the mass of a proton. And since protons and neutrons are the dominant stuff in your body, the empty space is responsible for 90% of your mass. So, if that's the case, let's calculate the energy of nothing where there's nothing else. We knew the answer was zero, because it's the only sensible answer. So we knew the answer. We didn't know what the symmetry was, but we knew the answer was zero. And science is empirical. Knowing the answer means nothing. Testing your knowledge means everything. We can use gravity to weigh the universe, including the weight of empty space. General relativity tells us that space is curved, and therefore the universe can be a one of three different geometries, open, closed, or flat. Weighing the universe tells us what the curvature of the universe is, and that's why we want to weigh it. About 50 times as much mass in this system, and in all systems we can measure, comes from stuff that doesn't shine. And physicists with their linguistic perspicacity have called it dark matter. And we now understand that 90% of the mass of galaxies and clusters including our own Milky Way galaxy, is made of stuff that doesn't shine. We know how many protons and neutrons there are in the universe. We can actually measure that. And there aren't enough to make up all this dark matter. We now know the universe has only one-third the amount of matter to make it flat. The problem is that theorists like me knew the answer. The universe must be flat. Why? Well, there are two reasons. There's the one I normally say, which is it's the only mathematically beautiful universe. But there's another reason that I don't usually say, talk about, but I'll talk about here. It turns out that in a flat universe, the total energy of the universe is precisely zero, because gravity can have negative energy. So the negative energy of gravity balances out the positive energy of matter. What's so beautiful about a universe with total energy zero? Well, only such a universe can begin from nothing. The laws of physics allow a universe to begin from nothing. You don't need a deity. You have nothing, 
Zero total energy and quantum fluctuations could produce a universe. In fact, it's right now we know to an accuracy of better than 1%. The universe is flat. It has zero total energy and it could have begun from nothing. Why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is there had to be. If you have nothing in quantum mechanics, you'll always get something. It's that simple. There's only 30% of the stuff in the universe needed to make it flat. Where's that other 70%? Well, if you put energy in empty space, so empty space weighed something, that would cause the expansion of the universe not to slow down over time, but to speed up over time. And if just for fun one believed it was speeding up and asked how much energy would you have to put in empty space to make it speed up by the amount we measure it, it's exactly the amount we are missing. Everything holds together. Our new picture of cosmology is that we live in a universe dominated by nothing. The largest energy in the universe, 70% of the energy in the universe, resides in empty space. This completes, in some sense, the ultimate Copernican principle. This tells us that we are more insignificant than we ever imagined. If you take the universe, everything we see, stars and galaxies and clusters, everything we see, if you get rid of it, the universe is essentially the same. We constitute a 1% bit of pollution. We are completely irrelevant. Why such a universe in which we're so irrelevant would be made for us is beyond me. If there are an infinite number of universes, then you don't need a theory of everything. Forget what I wrote there. You need a theory of anything. You just need an infinite number of universes and some theory that tells you anything can happen. We have such a theory, and I did want to spend one minute telling you about it. It's called string theory. Here's the, here's the brief summary of it. One person said to another, I just had an awesome idea. Suppose all matter and energy is made of tiny vibrating strings. The second guy says, okay, what would that imply? And the first guy says, I don't know. So that's, that's a history of string theory in the last 25 years. We should realize that, that where there's more we don't understand about the universe than we do. And I want to give you an example of this. The far future. What's going to happen in the far future? Remember, 100 years ago, we thought we lived in a static, eternal universe. For civilizations that live in the far future, what will they see? Well, the universe is accelerating. That means all the distant galaxies are getting carried away from us, and eventually they'll move away from us faster than the speed of light. They will disappear. The longer we wait, the less we will see. In 100 billion years, any observers and civilizations evolving around those stars will see nothing except for our galaxy. All evidence of the Big Bang will have disappeared. And those scientists will discover quantum mechanics, discover relativity, discover evolution, discover all the basic principles of science that we understand today, use the best observations they can do with the best telescopes they will build, and they will derive a picture of the universe which is completely wrong. They will derive a picture of the universe as being one galaxy surrounded by empty space that's static and eternal. What it really should tell us is we've discovered this crazy picture of the universe that we don't understand at all. It all holds together. But maybe if we had evolved five billion years earlier, there would have been observables we could have seen that would have changed that picture. Maybe five billion years in the future, it'll be different. The universe remains mysterious. But I do want to say in the far future, this is the picture. We will be lonely and ignorant, but dominant. And those of us who live in the United States are, are used to that. <laughs> let, me, let me end. Okay, that's the end. Thank you.